Tony Finau doing a mic check. Check, 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 check. One, two, one, two. You're usually not a guest on people's podcasts. You have your own. Yeah, that's right. I've been I've been a guest on a few, but yeah, we my board Summer Hayes, my coach and I, we kind of started our our own maybe just over a year ago. Do you? Uh, well, welcome to the Eric Anders Land yeah, Show. First thank, of all, thank you, Eric. I appreciate the time. Yeah, of course. Um, what have you learned from being a podcast host <laughs> aside from being a pro golfer? Yeah, well, uh, I've learned that I think there, you never know what crazy stories you have on the golf, you know, on the golf course and just through life. So we kind of wanted to share that through podcasts and it, man, it's pretty cool actually. You know, I get on there and and get on some rants with, uh, uh, you know, sharing some life experiences with my coach. It seems to be pretty fun. A little bit of therapy, it seems like sometimes. And um, we had, you know, a lot of people take a liking to our podcast. So it's, uh, it's, it's been really more than what we, we could have hoped for, for our, for our first year. You know, I think my favorite part about the same thing here, right. Is, yeah. is like very rarely do you get a chance unless you're like in therapy yeah. to just talk for an hour or yeah, whatever it is. Exactly. Um, and you're busy. You're always traveling. Yeah. What do you do to like restore yourself? Is, is the podcast one of those things? I think the podcast is one of those things because I, I usually do it um, on an off week, you know, or I'll do it early in a week where I'm playing. Um, yeah, but I mean, I have, you know, I've got four kids. My wife and I've got four kids and we still, you know, and, and we're, st we're still pretty young. Uh, so our kids keep us pretty busy. You know, they keep us pretty grounded. Yeah. Kids seem to do that, you know, when you're a parent. And, and so, you know, I, I still play a lot of basketball. You know, I don't think my manager would be that happy to hear that, but... I play a lot of basketball still. My wife's picking up pickleball. So we, I think we still have hobbies and things. Um, pickleball. You know, pickleball. Are you, are I tell you, you what, bro. I, I like pickleball. I, my wife loves it. <laughs> I, I, I think I like it. You're, so. you're, it's probably like pickleball is not the best use of your strengths, of your assets. I mean, you're, I don't think so because it, it, it kind of handicaps you just in that if you know anything about pickleball, there's a, there's a line that you can't really cross. You can't get too close to the net. Yeah. So it kind of takes away, you know, some <laughs> athleticism, I think, and like your reach, the reach advantage I would have. So with those restrictions, uh, you know, I, I, w I can't say I'm like a super legit pickleball player, but it is fun. What question do people always ask you? Oh, well, I think the two biggest questions I get are, how's your ankle doing? Because they always think that that's a great way to start a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the second one is uh, pertaining to my career, you know, when are you going to win again? You know, my last win on the PGA Tour is in 2016. Um, and I've come, I've had a lot of seconds. I've had, I've had a lot of close calls. Unfortunately, haven't uh, gone my way in, in some of those second place finishes. But those are the two probably main questions that I get, you know, from most people. And, and, and again, I think that first one still trumps the second because Everybody thinks seems to think that that's the, the best way to start a conversation. Hey, that's what you want. How's talk your about. ankle, fee now? So. Well, here's the interesting thing about the ankle thing. First of all, that was your first Masters. That's right. What an incredible like it, like journey that you're yeah. on. The roller coaster of emotions through that first <laughs> Masters was like really unbelievable. Well, I, also, because it came quick too. Like it yeah. was like all of a sudden you were yeah. like uh, you know FedEx Cup. All of a sudden, you're yeah. playing all the majors. Yeah. Masters is the first one of the year. Yeah. And it was just like, this guy, Tony Finau, is amazing. Yeah. And I was actually in the Caddyshack. Oh, wow. With a bunch of players. Okay. And we were watching the TV. Oh. And we watched you. <laughs> so uh, I had to watch that live. We watched you dunk. And, and it was just, everyone was like, yes. And then, I'm not a pro athlete, but there were a lot of, <laughs> of your colleagues in there. DJ yeah. was there, and everybody was just like, whoa. And... I guess, I mean, we don't need to talk about that. You, didn't want, you don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I, that's what you want to talk about. <laughs> no, what I really want to talk about is, well, first of all, just the, the energy surrounding that exciting thing. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Sunday at the Masters the next year, yeah. was, that, was that more intense, like a bigger moment for you? Yeah, there are two different, there are two very different years, um, but both great, you know, in respects to both, but to understand the excitement I had after that par three and the hole in one, I think I have to kind of take you back in 1997. That was the first masters I had ever watched. Okay. So, and, and I started playing golf in the summer of 97, you know, all golf fans know that the masters is usually played in April. So obviously it had such a big effect on me that I wanted to start playing. And my brother had already been playing at the time. So 20 years later, I finally qualified for my first masters. The masters is the one tournament I always watched on TV you know, the green jacket, just the ambient, everything, the music, Jim Nance sports. I don't know what it is, just everything. If you're a sports fan and, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you probably, the one turn golf tournament you watch is probably the Masters. So the buildup behind what the Masters was in Augusta National to me was, it was like, I was, it was, I was like a dream, I was like dreaming that week. So finally on Wednesday, you know, we get there and 
to make a hole in one for me, you know, for me, that was my first, you know, appearance. And, and again, that buildup of just having watched the par three, the history behind the tournament, I, I just, I was so excited. Like, sure, it was one of the greatest moments of my life. It may be, you know, the greatest, you know, moment in my, you know, in my life, in my personal life, just because it was like, I made a hole in one. Millions of people are watching. It's my first Masters. My family's here with me. I mean, it just, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. So I, I took off running. That seemed to be the, you know, uh, what I, you know, it, it was just a spur of the moment type of celebration. And, uh, and when I, when, you know, when I kind of snapped my ankle, uh, a lot of things kind of changed. You know, I knew, you know, I, I could be in trouble as far as physically to, to even play the tournament. But it, you, you ended up playing great. I no did. problem. I did. And I think. Five, I think, fifth, right? T5? No, I finished 10th. I Tenth. finished T5 last year right. in 19. But in 18, I finished in the top 10. And uh, and I actually That's insane. It, it really was. I was leading the tournament through 15 holes. That's insane. That first round, and this is you know less than 18 hours later after you know <laughs> shattering my ankle. So it was quite the change of events. And then walking off the 18th green on Sunday, I literally felt like I had just won the Masters. I, I birdied six out of my last seven holes to finish in the top 10. And like, again, I, you know, until I win a green jacket, that's probably still the, my favorite moment of all time. I need to understand. Have you, you must have tried to understand. Birdies six of seven yeah. of the final holes at yeah. Augusta on yeah. Sunday. What, how, what, how does that happen? How do you do that? What's happening? What is going on? Oh, uh, man, you're just, you're just kind of locked in. You're kind of zoned in. You know, I, I didn't really feel that nervous. You know, I was kind of just, I made, I made birdie on 12, made birdie on 13. Birdie on 14, birdie on 15, birdie on 16, and then I hit the best shot of my career. I blocked my tee shot on 17, uh -huh. and I ended up hitting from 190 yards this slice five iron around the trees from the pine straw to three feet, and I birdied 17. So there's six in a row. And not only did I, I had a chance to move up the leaderboard on 18, but I had about a 12-footer straight, straight up the hill, the putt that a lot of the guys have made to win the tournament. Um, and, I, and I literally left it right on the front of the lip. Or that would have been seven in a row and tied the record for most birdies in a row in my first Masters. So that would have been cool. But, um, man, that was – you're kind of you're in a zone there, and, and I definitely was. How does that compare to playing with Tiger and literally being in the group where he gets the one of the most iconic photos ever taken? It was two totally different years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was two totally, it was two totally different years. Just in that the first year with what had happened on Wednesday leading up to the tournament – I didn't really have that much expectations. I was going in not knowing how I was going to feel with my ankle. And so the, the week was kind of a dream week. I made the cut. I was in, you know, I, I ended up playing well on Sunday. 2019 was totally different. You know, I went in with a lot of confidence knowing that I liked the golf course. I played well on one bad wheel. Why, why can't I win a green jacket now? So my, my mindset, I think, and the whole entire, um, yeah, just the whole entire mindset for me was different in 2019. And I was able to play my way right into that final group on Sunday, and uh, lo and behold, I'm playing with my golfing idol, Tiger Woods. I had dreamed of beating him in, in a Masters many times. I have hit practice putts against him uh, many times uh, growing up, and, and now I finally had my chance. Did you um, tell him any of this? No, I'm sure he knows. <laughs> he knows. He knows everyone's I'm sure he knows. Everybody's out, to, everybody's out to beat him. We all have those aspirations and dreams. Did he, did he say anything during the final round where you were like, whoa? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been quoted sharing one one story, and I'll just share it real quick. Um, so I, I say hi to him on you know on the first tee. Good luck. He says the same thing. Play well. Um, don't really talk to him at any of those first few holes. On number seven, I hit my tee shot um, last, and I'm walking off walking off the tee box, and Tiger and I are just walking right next to each other. It's pretty much just custom when you're walking next to somebody, you just you know start talking. So I had asked him how his kids are doing, and uh, and he gave me the most blank stare. <laughs> he looked he looked over at me and he said, "Fine." And he looked straight back and just laser focused. So I knew he was all business that day, and he didn't really, you know. The next time we exchanged words is when I was congratulating him on uh, on winning his green jacket on wow. 18. So um, that's pretty much the, the extent of our conversation. And he's when he plays, he's definitely all he's definitely all business. You throughout you know you throughout your life, your story, seeing the world through your eyes. Like those two stories are fascinating. You must have so many other things that are through your eyes that no one has seen. It's can you share some of it? Like like in general, like yeah, it's it's pretty it's not pretty golf related. Yeah, necessarily. yeah, it's pretty incredible. Because um, I, you know, for me, I started playing and I learned the game from scratch with my dad. Um, I, you know, I was I got taught to play the game, but from someone that didn't know anything about the game. 
And so to just have gone through this journey together with my dad and in our family, you know, with my wife, you know, really coming from nothing to having these opportunities is pretty hard to explain. You know, really, like you said, if I kind of take a look back at some of the experiences, it's it's quite cool. You know, the game has so much to offer. I, we would have never known. We've never guessed. But I think most importantly, the relationships that I've gained just through my career, you know, starting from I was a kid all the way, just the people that I've met, um, the support that I've got, and just the relationship that I have now, I would have never, when I was a kid, I would never know that I'd have, you know, at 29 years old that, you know, Tiger would be a friend and he would be someone that I could text and I could call. He'd be in my phone contacts and, and Phil Mickelson, I would know on a personal level. I, like, those are things that are just way beyond even things that I think I w- could have dreamed of. So going through this journey and, and kind of, you know, for me sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty blessed. You know, I'm pretty lucky to have had these opportunities, you know, and, but it, it kind of speaks to the work, work ethic and, and what it takes to, to aspire to do something. And, and if you put the work in, you can be anybody, you know, you can accomplish some of those things and some of those aspirations and dreams you have. If you text a tiger right now, how long do you think it would take him to respond? Like, what, I think he'll text me right away. His response rate is pretty quick. Yeah, I think he'll text me right away. You know, if, what is he in your phone as? Tiger. <laughs> just, just tiger. tiger. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, just tiger. I, um, I mean, I can show you. Uh, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's just, it's just it, tiger. <laughs> it, um, the, the, uh, you, you, uh, you're known for a lot of things. I think one of the things that um, moved me and moved a lot of people was your uh, personal IGTV post during the summer's Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's so wonderful and so powerful to have the ability to share directly from you to, to the world. You have a story that is, like, uh, incredibly unique. And what you talked about was, like, it, it was, like, impossible. It, 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 it did so many things, I think, for so many people. Do you have an idea of what it did? You, you, and to, to sum it up, I'll, I, if you don't mind, I would like to, in this podcast, I, I could actually record the audio and play it for people who didn't get a chance to hear it. Sure, yeah. It was beautiful. Do, do you have any idea of the benefit that came out of that? No, I don't. But I felt, I felt like I had to share it. You know, it was kind of impressed, impressed on me just through things that have been going on in our country that I needed to just share a personal experience. Um, you know, one of, uh, I felt like police brutality and, and, and some of the social issues that are addressing, you know, that are addressed now in our country. Um, a lot of sports have, uh, taken the right to kind of move forward with what they feel like is the right thing to do. And that's the great thing about our country. We have the freedom of speech to, um, I feel like protest in, in a peaceful way where others can learn from us. And, and, I, and I think that's the biggest thing that I've taken away uh, from the year is that I think a lot of us have a lot of learning and understanding to do when it comes to um, the social issues. You know, like you mentioned, Black Lives Matter is a big movement that has been going on this year. And, you know, a lot of times for us, I think we have that opportunity to just listen to, to our brothers, you know, to our African-American brothers and sisters and, and just learn from them. You know, we don't know what it's like, (laughs) you know, honestly, I shared a story, but I think I'm a very watered down version. If, if you're not an African American in this country, you know, then everything that I share as a Polynesian pertains more to Polynesians than it actually does to African Americans, you know, because I think we have more of a watered down version of, of, of what some of them have gone through in that movement. Um, so I think we can all learn from each other and, and just continue to pay attention to, to what's going on around us. And, and I think we can do better as a country when it comes to those things. For me, like my, my take on it is, I mean, I'm like the last person who should be talking about it, but in a way I felt it even myself, like with regards to golf, actually for yeah. me, uh, when I came into the game, it was like, Oh, this is not for me. Like I didn't, what I had seen about the game of golf made me think that I wasn't going to yeah. fit in. Right. And I have still seen that and that's yeah. totally fine. I'm convinced now that my purpose here is to make as many people as possible feel welcome to try the game of golf. Yeah. Did that ever happen to you before the 97 masters? Were you ever like basketball is kind of where everyone's pushing me to go? Yeah. But I like golf. Yeah, no doubt. You know, definitely early in our career, my brother and I, we were, especially here in Utah, not only were the only Polynesians playing, but really the only, you know, kids of color that were playing, you know, junior golf. Um, and, you know, it felt a little different early on, 
but you know, for the most part, we gained a lot of great friends. As I mentioned before, you know, I had a lot of, got a lot of relationships since I was a kid that I still have to this day, um, from friends and, um, the game has so much to offer. And, and, and I say that just in a way that hopefully people know that there's a, everybody can fit in. I feel like to the, to the game of golf financially, it's extremely tough. You know, there's no question about it. It's so much more, it's so much more easy to play a game like basketball or football. You know, there's not as many, as much equipment involved. Um, you have to learn how to play on a golf course, you know, you know, playing other sports, you just go to a park, you show up with a ball and you can learn how to play. So there's some, there's some things, um, that are tougher about golf that makes it harder for kids to play. But if you give it a chance, I think you, I think you'll love it. And, and that was the chance that our family was willing to take. And, um, and now it's, it's, it's an, it's been an amazing game to us. When you first, when, when were you first like, Oh wow, this game is <laughs> incredible. You know what I mean? Like, was it the sweet spot? Was it like a score? Was it, what was it? Yeah, I, w- I would probably say it's like when I, f- Monday qualified into my first PJ Tour event. I was actually 17 years old. So I was still in, you know, I, I was just out of, fresh out of high school. And I had just qualified for a PJ Tour event. When I saw how PJ Tour players were treated and then just, how, you know, the golf course, how much nicer they were. Um, and just just everything about being, on a, being at a PGA Tour event, being inside the ropes, you know, signing autographs. And um, I, I was like, I just got a really small taste of, what it could potentially be like. So I would say at that age, you know, I, I also played a junior tournament called the Westfield Junior PGA where they treat you like, you know, PGA, a PGA Tour player. And that's ran by the PGA of America. So, and that was at the age of 14. So I would say those two experiences are probably ones I look back on and like really got a taste of what it, what it could be like if, if I were ever, were ever to be somebody in the game of golf. When you're in a difficult situation on the golf course, or in life, is there a mantra? Is there something? Is there like a memory? Is there like an image that you use to get through it? Yeah. So my my dad, there was three rules that my dad had for us to learn how to play the game of golf, and they had absolutely nothing to do with golf. <laughs> um, but he made it in a way where we thought that that's how we had to learn how to play golf. The first one was listen. Um, he was our instructor, so that you know he felt like that was the right thing. The second one was. Uh, be serious or be focused and the third one was never give up and and I would just say the third one is probably is probably my mantra um never give up you know because there's gonna be so many roadblocks you know I feel like throughout your life if especially if you want to accomplish anything worth something um you're gonna you're gonna run into roadblocks and and I've run into many and 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 still Tell me some. and still and still are well I, it took me seven years to get on tour when I turned professional at 17 years old I didn't, I didn't become a PJ tour member until I was 24 in those seven years. They were the hardest years of my life. Um, just in that financially I had nothing and I was trying to make my way to the PJ tour. It's extremely tough. I was staying in hotels, you know, you know, I, I only had cash, didn't even have a credit card, learning how to deal with, you know, not having a car and just that because I wanted to accomplish what I felt like I could. I, I was trying to get to the PJ tour. Um, Going through that was extremely hard, but I, it was seven years. It wasn't like it was, you know, two weeks I tried and I'm like, you know what, this ain't going to work out. I grinded my teeth, but I had that mantra of just, just don't give up. You know, there's, there's grass on the other side of this. And I continue to believe that and, and have faith that eventually it'll work out. And eventually it did, you know, it, it took about every ounce of, <laughs> of believing in myself as I could offer. But, um, I finally got on the web.com tour. I won on the web.com tour at, the. Uh, at 24 years old, and, and there I was finally a PJ Tour member after those seven years of, um, of going through some tough, some tough times to just try and accomplish my dreams. But I would say that that mantra is probably one that um, I can have because, you know, I think a lot of times in life, you know, I maybe not felt like giving up, but maybe this isn't for me and I can pivot to do something else. But everything always drew me back to what I always felt like I knew I could do. And... Yeah, I just didn't give up on, on my dreams, and, and I was able to finally finally break through on the PGA Tour. I was uh, I I I want to talk to you about being Mormon because I'm yeah. so I'm so uh, interested in anything that helps people, I guess, access like love essentially, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Like that's a big part of what we do with Random Golf Club, and just sort of the idea of uh, breaking down anything that might separate two people. Yeah, and. Uh, I love that. Thank you. I mean, I didn't yeah. invent it, but <laughs> no, no, I was, yeah. but we do it in golf. Yeah. And 
you know, I've seen that with my friends who are LDS, and yeah. and I was sad to learn that you didn't go on a mission. <laughs> I like was expecting some awesome mission story. Yeah, you made the decision not to yeah. because of golf creating a platform. Or yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. I, I feel like I, I am on my mission, you know, and I've been on a mission to a lot of different countries at this point, and and, and doing my thing. But you know, I think the 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 strongest way I can put it is, you know, I I felt like golf was my mission. I, I really did. And, and as a strong member of the LDS faith, you know, I had always dreamed of going on a mission. I always thought I was going to go on a mission. Um, but when the opportunity presented itself, um, I, I took golf as, as, as my mission. And it, and it ended up being that that was the right thing for me, I felt like, you know. And, um, but, you know, being a member, it's very, there's not a lot of us on the tour. There, there, I think there's two of us. It, you know, it, Daniel Summerhays and myself, yeah, I was both like Utah, Summer and you, yeah. yeah, both Utah guys, uh, both Utah ties. Um, but wait, um, now that uh, you know, I think Zach Blair, Zach, yeah, Zach Blair is on is on tour. I think a little less active, but he is, but he is, but he is a member. Um, you know, but the the biggest thing, you know, coming from an, an LDS background and having the having the faith, I think is just exactly that. You know, I, I have I've always had faith um, in in better things and and the guy and and the church has taught me that you know and a lot of the way that i feel like i i act and and try to um is just from what i've learned and not only from uh from the church but from my parents and and learning to just try and be a good example you know i think we're all children of god i believe that and um we can all help we can all help each other in in some way and and i hope you know that's to me that's my mission just just to be a light to everybody and if people take a liking to who I am or what I do, hopefully they know what that comes from. That you know that light is is from one source, and I believe that source to be Jesus Christ. Um, but I can only uh, try my best to to act according to what I believe. And again, if people draw draw to me uh, because of the way that I am and the way that I act, again, you know that's light, and that that light comes from one source. I feel like. It's so beautiful, man, because the, 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 the hardest thing for me is when I experience in myself or as a bystander uh, the game of golf being a selfish game. Do you know what I mean? Like it is kind of a selfish game. It really is. And, yep. and, and, uh, and, and it doesn't have to be. Yeah. You know, and the most people that don't view it as a selfish game have some type of spiritual situation. Bernard Langer was one of the first people. I said, Bernard, do you think golf is a spiritual game? And he said, um, I didn't. Until I became Christian, then I realized that uh, I'm not playing for myself. Yeah. Do you have any way of incorporating directly that faith into the game of golf as a competitive venue? <laughs> yeah, I love I love what Bernard said. Um, do I? You know, if you ask me that same question, I don't know if I would say golf is a spiritual game, but you know, I I do believe like I'm a I'm a sp spiritual being and trying to live in a physical world, you know, and in a temporal world. And I think what I mean by that is, is I do believe we're all spiritual, spiritual beings first, you know, before we're actually human beings and beings, you know, that, that physically exist. Um, pertaining to the game of golf, anyone that asks me, do I have any rituals or do I, I really don't. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the most probably, I, I don't have any superstitions is what I'm trying to get at. And the only thing that I do is I pray. I, I just, I say my prayers, you know, uh, in the morning before I play and don't really ask for success or anything. I, I you know, I think I, I have a grateful heart to be in the position that I am. And, and I want to make sure that God knows that and that he knows that, you know, I think there's a plan for all of us. And, and, and if we do our best to accomplish what we feel like we can on this earth, I think, you know, we've got, we've got better life while waiting for us on the other side. See, but you don't drink coffee. No, <laughs> that, I just feel like you want to drink. Do you, do you want to drink coffee? Do you Man, think about no, it? I, no, I, I, yeah, I, I like, not good I, like for you. I like coconut water. You know? Coconut water, coconut water is like my, what's the morning routine like for thing. Tony? Yeah. So I, I eat a lot of oatmeal for breakfast. Okay. That's, uh, you know, I, I do like oatmeal, blueberries, walnuts, anything, peanut butter, peanut butter. Yeah. Throw Solid. some peanut butter and hot oatmeal. Let it melt. I mean, that is like, sounds good. Yeah. That's on point. Um, <laughs> and I, that I would say for I drink, five hours. I drink, yeah, I'd probably drink more coconut water than than really anybody that you know is that a Samoan thing or is that just like yeah I, just, maybe it is you know maybe it's a Polynesian thing genetically you know, we love, engineered yeah we love coconuts and <laughs> you know we have a lot of them hanging around the trees and the islands but I just love coconut water so I, I would say I drink a lot of coconut water um you know I, I work out probably three to five times a week I don't think anything crazy but I do have a pretty consistent 
things that I feel like I have to get done in the morning to kind of to kind of start my day. Sure. And I think that's important for for most people. Uh, what do people? What, do, what what I guess? Well, going back to the Mormon thing, what do people not understand? What are people like? Yo, I don't. I don't. You know, I mean, the coffee thing for me. But yeah, is there yeah. anything else? Well, I think that's that's one of the biggest things is is why do you not why do you not drink alcohol? You know, and yeah. I, and, and and that's that's not a direct question that I've gotten, but just I can see it in people's faces. <laughs> like, wait, this dude doesn't. He's You've not never that. had alcohol. No, ever. He's he's like this dude didn't take the wine. You know, the glass of wine or. Or the alcohol or anything, and I think the, that's probably one of the most misunderstood things in the Mormon church is why not, or you know, smoking tobacco or anything like that. You know, there's a thing called the Word of Wisdom that we believe in, and it's just basically everything in moderation. But if you start, you're not going to be able to quit, and that's kind of that's kind of what our leaders are are preaching against, and and what we feel like is is actual scripture. You know, and so we take that. If you're a member, you try and take that seriously. Right. Just in where, you know, caffeine is something that's extremely addictive. You know, just things that you can be addicted to, we feel like we, can, we should shy away from. And that's why alcohol, you know, I think alcohol is a, is a, is a huge issue in our, in our country, you know. And it's, it's, I think it's a responsibility that most people like to try and have. Um, but, you know, outside of alcohol, tobacco, and, and just there's just so many addictive things. But I actually agree with the church on this just to where... The easiest way to not do something is just to not start, and and so we do have this word of wisdom we call it, where, um, you know that's that's the reason why uh, we don't we try you know they they teach us to not start in any of those um, addictive things just because if they come addictive then you know they're very harming to our bodies and as I mentioned before we're spiritual beings and those your spirit will start to get tampered with when you physically. Uh, can't think straight when you're under under the influence. Yeah, yeah, you're cluttering the image. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I feel like I quit drinking twenty years ago. I, I, but I did drink a, quite a bit before. I, <laughs> I did. I had the hard experience. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna go play golf. Yep. Um, I'm a six handicap. Okay. What do we do? How do we do this? You're a where? Yeah. You're what a plus ten? I'm, I wouldn't say that, especially not on this golf course. <laughs> Definitely not here. We're at Promontory. We're yeah. at Jack's course. We are at the hardest golf course in Utah. 8,000... 8,100 8, yards. 8,100. Yeah. And it usually blows. It doesn't look too bad out there today. But if you're a six, um, you know, I if I shoot in the 60s here, it's really, really good. The, the course record here is 68. That's how tough this golf course is. I really don't know any other golf course, like, in the country where you can say 68 is, like, the course record. Um, you got but, at least 20 shots on me. Nine, yeah. 18? That, yeah. I would, I, would, I would say, like, I would say probably, like, just, like, one a hole. One shot a hole. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say that'd be from the same tees. That'd be pretty fair because that's we're both playing all the way back. If we, yeah, if we're both going all the way back, you know, I think we can we can adjust after we can adjust after nine. But maybe maybe on number one you get two because the long that hole is literally seven hundred and twenty yards. Seven twenty uphill. So maybe we go two there. Okay. And then uh, so maybe if, like two on seventeen. Because what do you typically get on number one? You, birdie or par? Yeah, one I, or two. How, yeah, how many I, times have you eagled it? I've never eagled number one. Never eagled number one. I mean, to even hit that green in two is like almost impossible. Yeah, I 720 guess. 720 yards. It's got to be downhill. I downwind. just did the math. Yeah. 400 um, and 300. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, or 350, 350. So, right. I mean, it's extremely hard to even get there, but I'll take four. I mean, if I start with a four there today, you know, course record watch. With the game right now, you and Boyd are working on 200 miles an hour. Ball speed. We're, yeah. Well, it's just we're working on I want my, I want my normal drive to go from – you know, I'm kind of living in the 180 to 182 right now. Really comfortable. That's my ball speed if I just swing a driver. And that's like, it's, it's like a punt. You're not even swinging, yeah, it's just, right? Yeah, it's just my normal stock little punch cut with my driver. I, I want to start living in, in the 185 to 190. So that's what we're trying to do. And my mechanics are allowing me to do that. So um, if, I, if I can do that, you know, I, I know for sure, you know, I'll be a force on the tour more so. Um, but I'll, you know, start to win and... Are you um, changing anything like in the driver setup, like specs with the driver? Not yet. No. You know, we may have to go with a little bit less loft. It seemed to take the spin off. You have so much press at address. Do yeah. you maintain that at impact? Yeah, no question. I started there and love that. And uh, yeah, I it's I just nasty. I've always had I've always had like that forward lean forward press. Yeah, um, it seems to work for me. So I'm I'm not going to change it. Were you? Are you? It, is part is part of this have to do with Bryson? Are you like <laughs> maybe? You no, know, hundred percent. There's no question. A part of it has to do with Bryson and. And the reason being is because I, I, I used to hit the ball really, really hard, really far. I used to live in the low to mid-90s. Like, that's what my playing speed was at. What age? Between about 16 to about 20. Okay. Yep, I would live right in that low to mid-90s. Like, I would play at that. The problem is I I would I didn't really know where the ball was going. 
yeah. you know, like I couldn't, I couldn't play at a high level because I wouldn't even hit in the fairway often enough or keeping it in play often enough. So I toned down all the way to where I'm at now, right around living around 180 to, you know, low to mid 180s if I wanted to. Um, so my theory was you can't play at a high level if you're swinging anything over 190. That's what my theory was because I had just come from that. Um, so after watching Bryson after quarantine come out and literally he's averaging like around 190 ball speed on average, yeah. you know, hitting at 195, 196 ball speed out and playing the tour and hitting it in the fairway, he kind of just changed my whole theory yeah. is basically what happened. Everybody's. Yeah. He was everywhere on Sunday at winged foot. Everywhere. He was but in the he, parking lot basically. Bro, he was hitting it. But like <laughs> he was so much further than everybody. He was just <laughs> chipping onto the green. So kind of, you know, he changed my mind just in that my theory obviously is false <laughs> all <laughs> and, of everybody's though yeah it's false because you know here comes bryson hitting a ball you know 190 to 195 miles an hour and just finding it and chipping it onto greens and winning tournaments so um i am gonna you know start cranking it up to where again i want to be able to live in the high 180s and if i do that that's that's 15 to 20 yards further than i'm averaging right now and you know we'll i think we'll be in business that's the club and a half it's a club and a half. Yeah. Um, so okay, so we're low, so we're gonna play eighteen today. Yeah, you, you insisted 18. on playing eighteen. You're like, I have to play eighteen. I mean, which I, seems you know, all, it's awesome. That I love you're a pro golfer. Yeah, and I love play. I love playing. So I love you know that. we're you know we're coming out here. We're doing the thing. Let's do it. We're gonna play with your buddies. Who are we playing with? We're playing with uh, Scott Pickering, my my good friend, and Otto. They're two of my uh, best friends, and and we're gonna have a good time. All right, so we're gonna go play. We're yep. gonna, we'll do a nine hole match, and then we'll we'll just have fun for the rest okay. of the other Perfect. nine. Sounds good. And then uh, so you'll get ten. That sounds fair. You'll do. We'll do ten on the first night. Okay. What are we going to wager? Are you are you allowed to gamble? Are you not allowed to gamble? Yeah. I mean, this is what I do for. This is what <laughs> I do for. You know, <laughs> Your life is. My a life is a gamble. You know, this is kind of what I do for a living. So I'm game. You know, if you want to, you know, I'm game with. What are we uh, going to play for? What do you like to play for? Are you one of those guys I, that's like you have? Do you do you travel with like an envelope of cash? Are you <laughs> a lot of guys? Guy? A lot of guys they actually do. do. I don't. Like ten G's in an envelope. Yeah, hundred percent. Like hanging out in the Samsonite. Oh, Jason Duffner. Everybody. Jordan Spieth. These guys. I know guys that they literally just carry a, like a, ca a backpack of cash. So I have like I'm a hundred dollar bill. I have a hundred dollar bill. Okay. I'm I can good. play for that. Yeah. Sounds good. Do you want to handicap the wager itself so that based on your net worth versus mine, the wager is, is weighted? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking not quite uh, yeah. my language. You know, no one really has figured that one out, but it, whatever. Anyway, so we'll, we'll play. <laughs> okay. I get 10 strokes. Yes, but we're not, we're doing match play. We'll do match play I just to it. make just to make it easier, I love you know, it. we don't have to keep stroking, you know, j just in case, you know, you might hit one out and, you know, we don't know what that the rule is. That happens a lot. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have this funny thing. So all the, I have a lot of friends that are amateurs. Sure. And a lot of them claim to be a certain handicap. Uh-oh. But, but the problem is with most amateurs is their handicap is very skewed because they actually don't play the rules. Oh. Just in that, like, if you hit a ball out of bounds and you don't find it, like, a lot of them just like, oh, I'll just hit three from right here. Right. Like... In golf, like you actually got to go no, like a real rule. you know. So I, that's like here's a question: for adding you. a shot like every few holes from what actually they shot. So you know, like most amateurs are skewed. So I actually only I I only play match play against amateurs that's because good. then it just makes it makes it a lot easier to keep track. Okay, last question for you: I played winged foot the week before the U.S. Open from okay. your set of tees. And what did you, what did you shoot? I want to ask you what I shot. Do, you're can six, you guess? I'm you're a six. six handicap, and you played the week before. Yeah, were the greens good? Yeah, and actually the rough was a little thicker from okay. what I saw. Okay. Um, I hit. Do you want to do you want to ask me any other question? You can ask me two other questions. Two other questions. Yeah. Ask me how many fairways I hit. How many fairways you hit? Two. Okay. I'm gonna go with 94. Yeah, 90, 92. I oh, think. I was gonna say 93. Yeah, 92. <laughs> yeah, I had to hole out from. Uh, I had to hole out on 18 nice. to shoot 89. Wow. Yeah, I was pretty proud of myself, and yeah, honestly, like I was. Right well, you should be. You should, I mean. Half the guys that played in our tournament shot in the mid '80s, <laughs> so you know, you barely got beat. You know, you barely got beat by half of them. But it's funny though, because how how relative is the game of golf inside your own head, right? Because you because you you here you're not you're gonna only want to shoot 67 today. That's all you want. That's all, yeah. I'm pretty much just going to try to break course record 100. All right, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. All right, see you later.